So today we are going to the book of Second Corinthians, chapter one, from first three to first seven. The book of Second Corinthians, chapter one, first three to first seven. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. So, if you follow our congregation sermon, you would notice that today we are taking a detour from the book of Genesis into the New Testament, Second Corinthians chapter one, verse three to verse seven. And today, the sermon topic is: Are you comforted in Christ? In recent episode of. The worldwide events, we have a lot of fear. We have a lot of anxiety. We have a lot of weariness and uncertainty up in front, up in front of us. You know, we don't know if we would still have a job. We don't know if the city or the county or even the state is going to get locked down. And you know, are we going to get food? Are we going to? Be okay. Are the hospital okay? And am I having the symptoms and things like that? So during this time, the most question being asked is still, how come God allow all this to happen? And most time we do not have an answer to that. And to be frank to you, I do not have an answer why God would allow bad things happen. You know, but.、Uh, That never stop us from having faith in God. And you know why? Because our faith is in response to the promise of God. It's not to the to the circumstances that happen around us. That would be the main difference. And most people, you know, think that okay, since God allow all this happen, then we shouldn't believe in this God. Well, I think that would be a wrong concept. The circumstances happen around us. Not necessarily reflecting the goodness of God. Well, at least not to you up front, right? If you never have faith in God, it will be very difficult to explain to you why God would allow this happen or that happen, because all that you need to know, in the first place, is that God sent His Son to die for you. For your sins, for your death, he show it on the cross for you. So if you reject the idea, or well, that's not the idea. If you reject God's salvation, if you reject God's love there, then I think it's kind of getting nowhere in that question, right? Why God would allow this happen? Why God would allow that to happen? Because our faith is responding to the promise of God in the first place, and everything comes from Christ. And you would find that pattern in all the letters of Paul. You would always see that you you know almost every single book, that written by Paul, okay. First thing he would do is is to praise God, and you would always find that in the first chapter. Of almost every letter that he wrote, and so in verse three you would see that praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort. Okay, so that's why 
if your faith is not building upon the promise of God, you would hardly see the goodness of God. You would hardly see the love of God because the love of God is shown through Jesus Christ being nailed on the cross for your sake, for your sins, for my sins, for everyone's sins. Okay. In order to understand your faith in God, you need to understand whether your faith is in Jesus Christ or not. Whether your faith is responding to the promise of God, and is not responding or reacting to the circumstances or the worldwide events that happen around you. And to be honest with you, all the things that is going to happen, you know, you know, all the worldwide events going to happen. It is already prophesied in the book of Revelations. So if you don't believe me, go read the book of Revelations. You would see that our current worldwide events are going according to what have been prophesied in the first place. Okay. So, Christians or not, you need to reflect on this point first before we go further into first three to first seven. Okay, is your faith, we, is your faith building upon the word of God? Is your faith responding to the promise of God? That's very important, because I I've known Christians that claim that they have faith in God, but they are reacting to the to the events that happen around them. When when the events are good, their faith are usually strong. But then when the time that the events are bad or not going according to their will, according to what they had planned and things like that, usually their faith are shaken. So as you can see, this type of faith will not survive during any tribulation, okay? Because it's not building upon the rock, the eternal God, the eternal word of God. And so, Christian, you need to you need to reflect on this. Okay, you need to think on this. You need to examine whether your faith is building upon the rock, responding to the promise of God, or you are just reacting to the to the things happening around you. Okay, one will get you through the trials of God. One will get you through all the worldwide events without shaking unto your core of your faith. Okay. But then the other one reacting to all the events, your faith is building on sand. Because it's building on something temporal, it's building on something that happened around you that can happen, you know, one way or the other. And that will shake yourself. You will find that your faith is not stable. You will find your faith just like the stock market today. You can go up two thousand point, and the next day you can drop three thousand points. Okay, it will be up and down, up and down like a roller coaster. You will find yourself not at peace at all because your faith is not responding to the promise of God. You're reacting to the events around you, and so if you are not yet a believer. And you are asking the question: How come God allowed all this happen? How come God did not take away this virus or take away this bad event, and then cure everyone? Hey, you need to understand, that's not the starting point. That's not the starting point to understand God, at all. Okay, you need to understand God from the beginning. Okay, and by beginning, I don't mean the Book of Genesis chapter one. Okay. By beginning, I mean whether you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, in order for you to be saved through your faith in Him. Okay, and I usually use this as a as a as an example to 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 straighten this out. Okay, I'm not a mechanic. I have no clue about what car is. Okay, other than knowing that you you stick your key into the thing and then you turn and then the car somehow start and then you can start driving. Okay, I have a driver license, so I know how to drive. But the main point for me to understand the car is not to go through the mechanic school. Okay, that's like, you know, if I'm really interested in knowing all the details. So for me, my first understanding about the car is to get the car key. That's all. 
I know how to turn the car key. I know how to start the car. That's my beginning understanding of how the car actually moves around. Okay. And if I go to a dealership, the dealership, the salespeople won't tell me all the mechanics about like how the engine goes or, you know, how the gas pump into the engine, I guess, and how the transmission go this and that, do this and that. They won't do that. All they are selling me is that whether you want to get the car key to go get a try, right? That would be usually how they sell. And the car key is very important. Without the car key, I don't. It doesn't matter how fast the car go. It doesn't matter. Okay. Without the car key, you got nothing from the car. So in order for you to understand the goodness of God, the love of God, and everything, you need to get that key to begin with. Okay. And that key is the gospel. That key is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Himself. That key is to understand that God sent His only Son, Jesus, who is Christ, to die on the cross for your sin. His blood cleanses your sins away. Okay, if you don't start that way, it's like me going to a dealership and the salesperson keep on saying that how the car is built. How heavy the car is, and you know how the engine works and transmission, you know all all those kind of thing, which means absolutely nothing to me. Okay. So without the key, you can say anything about God. Without the key, you can say anything about the car. Same concept, except you will never truly understand God without the gospel. Without beginning to understand the gospel, just like me, without the car key, give it a try. You know, try out the car, how fast it can go. All those numbers, all those explanation, meant absolutely nothing to me. So, everything will have a beginning of understanding point. Okay, so, in order for for you to understand. Why God allowed this and that happen? Whether God is good or not, you need to first understand the gospel. Whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not, whether you believe in God sent His only Son to die for your sin, that would be the first thing to go. And also, the first thing right here in this chapter. Where Paul Paul began his praise, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort. Notice that the God of all comfort, the Father of compassion. So if you do not accept that God sent His only Son to die for you, it's very difficult to grasp whatever the Bible say. Same as same same goes with the Christians. Okay, if your faith is not building on the foundation of the rock, if your faith is not building upon Jesus Christ, if your faith is not building upon the foundation of the salvation of your life. Then you would find it extremely difficult during this type of circumstances when everything goes negative, when everything seems like it's hopeless. You know, nothing works there. We, you know, we we got no solution in front of us and everything else. And the father of compassion usually go out the window with it and forget about the comfort as well because our faith is not building upon the rock. Is not building upon the word of God. So, you need to once again examine whether your faith is building upon the word of God. Okay. And then now, here from verse three to verse seven, there is one very important message. After you know examining your faith, which is, where did you get your comfort from? 
Notice that right here from verse 3 to verse 7. Whenever it mentioned comfort, it usually mentioned something about trouble. It mentioned something about discomfort in the first place. Okay, especially when the time you look at verse 4, okay, comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And then verse 5, notice the word suffering. And then in verse 6, um, notice the word suffering that we suffer and the word distressed. See, when do we receive comfort? In the most difficult time of our lives. God never promised that when the time you believe in Him, He will take away all your problems. He never promised that He will make your life, you know, as smooth as like, a, you know, sky's always blue, your bank account will always have money, everything will go, you know, all the trouble will go away, your problematic, you know, enemy will go away, all those things, God never promised it. But God promised something else. Whenever you face any problem, He is there for you. Whenever you face any distress, He is there for you. Whenever you lack of anything, He is there to listen to your prayer. Whenever you got anything, anything that you find that is not right in your life, He is there for you. And most time, most of the time, okay, we don't feel like He is there for us. Why? Because we are reacting to the circumstances that are happening around us. Now you see why the first point in this sermon, I ask you to examine whether your faith is building upon the Word of God or not. Because it builds up from there. It builds up from there. If your faith is building upon the Word of God, then whatever happens around you won't shake you. It will only make you want to know the will of God more and more. It will only lead you to want to know how God is going to comfort me in this circumstances. How God is showing His power through all the difficulties around me how he is going to get me through all this. Because without all those things, it's very difficult for you to fathom how great our God is. And without distress, without problems, it's very difficult for you to ask for comfort, right? Of course, God will not just out from nowhere give you all sort of difficulties so that you, you can experience His comfort, okay? But then you would also notice that the Bible already said so. Problem will come your way. Why? Because it's life. Whether you agree it or not, life is difficult, okay? Life is difficult. And the reason behind it, usually we don't want to spend too much time on that because that's a whole other sermon and a whole other theological debate on it. But then that's not the main point right here. But then whether you agree with the, what the Bible say or not, you would find that life is difficult. You will always have problem. And I always agree with the Chinese saying, if you don't have the worry right now, you, will, you are worrying something later which means that in your whole life, you are worrying about something. Difficulties will come your way, whether you like it or not. It won't knock on your door. It won't wait for your invitation, for you, for you to invite the problem into your life. It will come find you, whether you like it or not. Whether it is your own problem or your family problem or your friend's problem or your wife's problem or your husband, you know, your children or anything it will come find you okay so life is difficult anyway but then this is where the greatness of god the goodness of god comes in it's exactly because you are going through all those difficulties and you will find comfort in god 
and that is a given. God will comfort you. God will comfort you. As much as I want to say that you are going to live a problem-free life, sorry, I can't promise that. Because the Bible never promised me that or promised anyone about that. But then the Bible continuously promising us one thing, God will be there for you. So Christians, do you want this promise or not? Do you want this to be realized, to be fulfilled in your life? Do you want God's comfort in your life? You know, one thing that struck me, like, shocked me the most in the Bible is that we, as human, okay, we, we can refuse comfort. Do you know that? Have you ever experienced, like, like, like uh, you know, a fight? in your relationship, when the time the other party wants to apologize to you, wants to comfort you, wants to make it up for you, and then you just refuse it, okay? And there is one great example that is um, in the book of Genesis, when Jacob find, find out that, you know, uh, his sons told him that um, Joseph was torn apart by the wild animal and here is his uh, beautiful garment and then there is blood on it, you know, examine and then Jacob was in utterly shocking and, uh, you know, a very, very sad and upset and, you know, I, I, I can't find the right word to explain that because losing a son is like really, really painful, okay? And he refused the comfort from around his family. He refused it. And this is the tricky part. You know, people can refuse comfort. People want to be in misery sometimes. You want to be upset. You want to be upset in that particular event or in that particular issue that you refuse comfort. And that, why it shocked me the most, because I always thought that, you know, when the time you are upset and someone wants to comfort you, you usually want to be happy again. But then at certain time frame or at certain, certain circumstances, you, you, you refuse comfort. As if you feel like that, you know, I, I should be more miserable right now, so I shouldn't be comforted in any way. So Christians sometimes can be overwhelmed by the events happening around you to the point that when God sent his worker to comfort you, you just say that, yeah, you say that right now because you are such and such people or you are, you, well, for me to be an example, well, you are the pastor, of course, God will look after you. I, you mean, I mean, look at me, I, I don't go to church regularly, I don't read the Bible, I don't pray enough, so it's normal for, for God to, you know, ignore my prayer or let me go through all these difficulties, you know. And somehow you refuse the comfort from the Word of God. And here I say it, you know, the comfort written in the Bible, the comfort comes from God. And we can refuse it. We don't want it. But then Paul here is saying that, you know, mentioning the, the, the relationship between the distress, the suffering, and the comfort, they actually link with each other. They link to each other. Whenever you suffer as a Christian, you can find comfort in God. And why would God allow you to go through all the difficulties or, or all the bad things that you don't want? It's because when the time you face those, you get comforted by God so that in the future you can comfort one another when people go through similar situation like you do. And notice that I say similar situation is not the same. Why? Because not one event is the same with another event. It's not. It's not. It's not. You can find the same category, but it never is the same event. Meaning, I fail exams all the time when I was a child. 
So I knew exactly how you feel when the time you don't, you are not good academically. Okay. I know how that feel. But then I cannot say that when the time you fail the exam is the exact same thing as I fail the exam. It's not. I can find the similarity. I I understand how you feel, but then it's not the same event. Why? Because my parents may react differently from your parents. You know. I always find one thing interesting is that one. One student may be really upset when the time he got ninety nine points out of a hundred, and then another student find that he got sixty seven points from that set from the same exam, and then he was cheering up. Why? Because one is holding a grudge that he lost one point in that exam, but then another person thinks that okay, C minus, I pass. <laughs> Funny, right? And it's not just the attitude different, but then it's not the same event. It's not the same situation. But then, Christian, you need to realize that not one event is the same, but then, but then, they fall into the same category. So when the time you get comforted from God in your life event. You will you will be able to find one thing very good, that is, in the same category. You can use the same comfort from God that comforts you, to comfort one another. Amazing, right? Why can you do that? Because the word of God, is eternal. Is eternal. It never changes. It never move, and it never alter itself. And that's why, when the time you get comforted in God, meaning that when the time you face difficulties and you find strength from reading the Word of God, which is reading the Bible, you hold on to that promise. You hold on to the Word of God, and that part of the Word of God gets you through that difficulties. And that's why in the future, same category events happen around you in other brothers and sisters' life. You can use the same part of the scripture to encourage one another, and that makes a huge difference from the comfort you are trying to comfort one another. Why? Because your word is temporal, but the word of God is eternal. The word of God can apply to every single person, but then. Your testimony is very real to you, but it may not be very real to other people. Not that I downplay your experience with God, but the main point I want to draw here is the difference between your own word of comfort and the word of comfort from the word of God. Do you see the difference here? And. This part of the scripture, verse three to verse seven, I love it the most. Even though when the time I live through it, it it is like going through hell because, well, in order for you to get comfort, you know, you you are going through some suffering or distress or problems or difficulties in your life, and I got my fair share from God. Okay, but every single time, every single time. God has His own way to show me this part of the Scripture is as real as it gets. When the time I faced my difficulties, I did not feel like I should be facing those things. God, you call me to be a pastor. Take care of me, right? Didn't I get a a a, a you know certain VIP pass that you know something that I don't need to go through? No, it's the other way around, because God called me to be His servant. I went through a lot. Why? Because of this part of the scripture. Now let's read it again. Okay, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trouble, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. 
For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in your in you patient endurances of the same sufferings we suffer. You see. Because Christ suffered for us, and we receive comfort from Christ. And today, I suffer because of Christ, and then because of His suffering, I got comforted. And then when I face my fair share of difficulties in my life, and I got comforted in the Word of God, so that today I can comfort you in the Scripture. So Christians, your suffering is for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice in it. Weird, right? I ask you to rejoice in the difficulties for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Because right now, you are suffering for the sake of other brothers and sisters. That is one of the reasons. The Bible say why we suffer. Yeah. That is one of the reasons why we suffer, because for other people's comfort in the future. And now you understand why in point one I say if your faith is not. Responding to the promise of God is very difficult for you to understand the Father of compassion, right? The goodness of God, right? It's very difficult for you to understand why God allow bad things to happen in your life, right? Because one of the reasons that the Bible lay out for your suffering is because you are going to going through all the suffer to get comforted by God, so that in the future you can comfort one another in the same category of events. And that's why, if your faith is not coming from or or building upon the rock, upon the gospel, then your faith is not strong. It's not stable. It won't grow. It will always be shaken by the worldwide event of or or just your life event, and your faith shatters. When things goes wrong, your faith shatters. When fa- when things go right, your faith seems so strong, and. In my personal perspective, that's not faith at all. That's not faith at all. And so, Christians, do you see the relationship between comfort and distress, comfort and suffering? Christ demonstrate that for you already. Why can we get comforted? Because He suffered for. Our sins. He suffered for our sins, so that today, today we can reconcile with God the Father. So that we receive the blessings from Him, because why? He suffered for us. He died for us. And it's based on the same thing, based on the same reason. Today you suffer a little bit. For the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and by kingdom of heaven, I mean for the sake of your brothers and sisters. You see how important that is now. Don't underestimate when difficulties hit your life. Christians, don't underestimate when difficulties hit your life. You know how important that is. You know how valuable that is. It not it does not only help you to grow in faith. It also help you to understand how God comfort you in your life, so that you can grow in Him, so that you can comfort one another for Him. And when you do so, when you obey God's plans in your life. You know what else God also promised you? Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. All the other things will be added unto you. 
you will be rewarded even if you only give the water to the little one. All those promises are written in the Bible for you. And when the time you chose to obey God, with that, you know, you know, no longer argue on the point, on the reason, on the logic behind it, because quite frankly, your logic may not be very logical in front of God. So don't be too self-righteous. Don't be so sure that you are always right. When the time you chose to obey God, when the time you chose to believe in the promise of God, and you will see that God has a plan for you to prosper, give you hope in the future. He's not trying to destroy your life. And I find it amazing that people, when, when, when bad things happen, people immediately think that God wants to destroy you. You know how easy that, you know, you know how simple and how easy for God to destroy your life? I always find it amazing. If God is that cruel, our Bible will only have three chapters and it ends somewhere in ten, verse 10 or 11. When, when, when the woman took the fruit, you know, ate it and gave it to her husband, ate it, and God's righteousness kicks in, they die, end of the story. If God is only righteous, if he is only a righteous God, you know that is how short the Bible is? Three chapters. Done. Done. It wouldn't take him too long, you know, to destroy our lives because we deserve it. We are sinners. According to his righteousness, none should survive. And it's not like he didn't warn us, okay? The day that you eat of it, you will surely die. It's not, there is like a probability or, or a high chance that you die. No, you will surely die. A hundred percent. 100% of the time, you will die. And that's what sin does. And so, stop, stop saying that God wants to destroy your life or He doesn't love you. He loves you so much and He is so patient for us to realize that His Word is the perfect Word for us to follow. He is so patient to the point that he doesn't mind how many times you argue with him. He stands firm in his promise for you. Yeah. Today we receive the blessing of God not because we worth anything in front of him, but because he is who he is. He is the faithful God. He loves us so much to the point that he wants to bless us. It's not prosperity gospel here, but then it never changes him. He wants to bless you. He wants to. But then, do you have faith in him? Do you obey him? Do you see the link here? So that in the, if, you, if you hold on to this link, suffering, comfort, suffering, comfort, distress, comfort, if you hold on to this link, you will be able to embrace it you will be able to embrace the suffering that God sets in your life. Why? Because you know that through all these trials, at the end of the day, God has the crown of life for you. And don't take my word for it. You know, go to the book of James chapter 1 to find it. When you go through all the, all the trials of God, and you chose to have faith in him, and you chose to obey him, there is crown of life for you. And so when Paul say all this, it's a valuable lesson for all Christians to hold firm to. Don't underestimate the so-called bad events in our lives. You know, in the book of Acts, if the if the you know, uh, Roman Empire did not persecute the Christians in the city of Rome, they wouldn't even consider leaving the city of Rome. But because the persecution happened and then the, the Christians have to scatter around and that's where the gospel start to move around. 
So don't underestimate that when bad things happen, you cannot understand God. No, especially through the suffering, especially through the distress, you will understand God a lot more. But then, do you choose to obey Him? Do you choose to hold on to this like verse three to seven, which is like a merely what four or five verses? Five verses, and it will help you endure the suffering in your life, to endure the distress in your life. And at the end of the day, you will you will see the hope of God in your life. You will find the hope of God in your life, and you see how valuable that is. You see how important that is in your life. If you don't see it, think again. Think again. You have God in your life, staying with you through all difficulties. And all the difficulties that you faced, that you go through with him, you receive the comfort from him. And once you're comforted in the word of God, you can use the same comfort to comfort one another. And so, you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to fear anymore, because you now understand. At the minimum, that all things are under control by God, and when you chose to obey Him, when you chose to submit unto this part of the Scripture, to embrace the suffering, to embrace the distress, to endure the difficulties in your life, to endure the trials of God. That as a blessing, brothers and sisters. Take that as a blessing in your life, and you will find your joy complete, your faith complete, according to the book of James, chapter one, from verse three to verse eight, I believe. Consider it pure joy, brother, when you go through the trial of God. Have in your armory of God, that God is giving you a hope in the future. He is there for you. Don't take for a second that God hates you. No, that's a lie. Constantly, you will find in the Bible how much God loves you. So, take it. Christians, remember it. Seal it in your brain. Remember it by your heart. That God loves you. That God wants to comfort you. God wants you to prosper, according to all that He promised you. So, brothers and sisters, I pray that in the midst of the coronavirus event happening around the world. And it's a very bad situation right now. Okay, I I admit that I totally agree with it. Okay, I have my fair share of worriness, but at the same time, once again I open my Bible and read it, and I only find comfort in there. Why? Because I know, God, is here, with us. So, in faith, do you want to receive him? In faith, do you want to believe in his promise that he is here for you? So that's very important, and I hope that brothers and sisters examine your faith, examine it, live in the word of God, stop, ju- stop just listening to the sermon. Listening to other people's like、um, Bible study. Stop just reading the Bible. Live it. Live in it. 
and you will see how much God, how much God wants to bless you, how faithful He is. And I hope that you will find that comfort in your life right now. So let's pray, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this part of the Scripture. Thank you for once again telling us that you are here for us, and that you are in control of everything, and through everything, is for the sake of us growing in faith. To know you more in our lives, to obey you more, to be transformed in the Word of God, not be transformed by the world. So, Father, I pray that you will be merciful unto us. You understand our weakness. So, Father, same as Paul, in our weakness, we boast in you. Because in our weakness. We reflect your strength in us, so that everyone who see our strength in our weakness will recognize that that is not from us; it is from you. So, Father, I pray that your name be exalted, your cross be exalted, not me, not anyone, but you be exalted. And Father, help us to worship you every single day. And help us to embrace the difficulties and trials in our lives, Father. Help us to see the truth. Help us to obey your promise. So, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit go before us, guide us to where we should be, and stay with us. Grant us the power, so that we live according to your word. Thank you so much, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.